If I can't get that right, then you can't trust me on anything else. <laughs> In this episode, oops, the historian fact checks himself. Also, another word from Michael's mentor. Passion in this business is of utmost importance. Then, meet the ARF. And, what's so special about this place? Plus, what does Adam Sandler have to do with any of this? That's all right now on Hollywood and History. Is this as surreal for you as it is for me? Hello, everyone. Hey, everyone. All right, to get started here, uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'll start off the top with our countdown. Our, our, we're counting down to two very important historical events. Hundred year anniversaries are very important. The just nice round number a century has gone by. 34 weeks from this week is the 100 year anniversary of the assassination of Talat Pasha. I always mispronounce it. I say pa, uh, Pasha, but it's Pasha, right? You got it right this time. Yeah. Pasha. Um, I'll get it wrong again in the future, but it's, after three years of trying, right? <laughs> uh, and and for those who are watching this that don't know, uh, a Pasha is a title. It's not a name. It's a. It's like a lord, right? Something like that. It's a, a title usually given to like very senior statesmen or military commanders yeah, during the Ottoman right. days, and even today in, in Turkey. Um, right. So or, you attain a certain rank or status. You become a, a pasha. And then about 11 weeks after that assassination, which is 45 weeks from this week, is what, Armin? The 100-year anniversary of what? His acquittal from the Berlin trial. Whose acquittal? Tellurian's. And that's what this show is all about, Sogamon Tellurian. His life, his life story, uh, the story of his people, and his act of justice by assassinating Talat Pasha. So we are in the home stretch of a very significant set of milestone anniversaries. 100 year, the centennial. So we're going to count that down. Get that out of the way up at the top here. Another thing I want to do before we move on uh, is some fact checking. Uh, there's a couple of things from our previous episode. One thing that Armin mentioned that he had misstated. Uh, if you go back and watch that, he did a very impressive 15-minute summary of the entire Ottoman Empire leading up to the Armenian Genocide. I mean, in 15 minutes, uh, and I didn't prep him for that, so that's all spontaneous and uh, just proves that he's got it all up here. <laughs> but he made one misstatement and... It was nagging at him, so I'll let him correct that. And then there's another thing that I want to correct. Before that, uh, in this episode, before we get too far, what we're going to talk about is when I first uh, came to this project, what happened, what led up to me coming to you know, the Armenian Genocide and Sogma Talerian. I'm going to talk, we want to talk about uh, the, the guy who actually translated this uh, transcript from Armenian was originally the German court trial translated to Armenian and then from Armenian to English. And this is the English version. We're going to talk about this guy. And then uh, another, if we have time, we're going to get to this other uh, other character that was very important in all of this coming to pass, that putting Solgamon in the right place at the right time to assassinate Talat. Um, and my our connection, Armin and I have a bit of a connection to this guy. So, Armin, what's your fact check? What are you correcting? Some little detail that you got wrong. <laughs> you don't have to go into detail, but what, what was it? That something you said about in your little history, very minor, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, thanks for bringing it up because I probably would not be able to go to sleep uh, without actually correcting this uh, on the record. Something just very minor, when I was talking about the, how the Ottomans got their beginning, I stated that the, the principality that was founded at the end of the 13th century was located in northeastern Turkey, what's now northeastern Turkey, which is a misstatement. It was actually found in what's now northwestern Turkey in a region called Bithynia. Very minor, but at least I can uh, rest easy and go to sleep just fine today. Right, man. It must be tough being a historian. Got to get everything perfect, or you'll just get called out by your your uh, your counterparts everywhere. <laughs> Very cutthroat competition, <laughs> right? You're no historian. You got that one date, that one location wrong. 
All right. Uh, then the other, the, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, if I can't get that right, then you can't trust me on anything else. <laughs> yeah. Everything you say is now undermined because you got one little detail wrong. Gosh. Well, the thing that I got wrong, actually, it's something that I, it wasn't in the, um, it wasn't in the podcast itself. It's something in the write up when I sent out an email and this is a, it's something that I need to c clarify. I keep catching myself and then I didn't catch myself. And I wrote up in the email uh, that Talat was the Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire, which he was, but not at the time that he ordered the, the extermination of the Armenians. He wasn't the Grand Vizier at that time. He was the Ministry of the Interior, which is the most powerful position uh, in the Ottoman government, well, would you say that in some senses the Grand Vizier is a more of a figurehead? Okay, I need to pause for a sec while I have this dumb expression on my face. Coming up, you'll see subtitles occasionally when Armin speaks. My Wi-Fi started messing with us, but the things he says are important, so we took the time to decipher his words the best we could. Oh, and while we're on this break, now's the perfect time to click subscribe and share. If you enjoy this content, think of someone else who might and send it to them. Do it. All right, back to where we left off. Would you say that in some senses the Grand Vizier is a more of a figurehead? I mean, at the time, Talat had consolidated quite a, a bit of uh, power under his title as the Minister of Interior in 1915. So perhaps this transition to Grand Vizier, which as we were talking about last time, as a you know, the head of the army, and it may have been more of a formality, but at their end, also helped establish his uh, authority even, or entrenched his authority even further at the time in January 1970. So. Um, might have been just a, a slight shuffling of the portfolios, but at the very least, it, it also established the fact that Talat was the, really one of the most, was the senior Ottoman official in the Ottoman government during the war. So Ministry of the Interior was, I mean, he's the one who had the power to do what he did. He was over the, he was over the interior. He was over the people, the, the populations, and he was responsible for, their well-being or or not, as is the case. All right. So the previous episode, uh, we I just had Armin explain who who Sogmon Talerian is, how important he is as a historical figure, and also he did a summary of the Armenian genocide in the history of the Ottoman Empire. So that's all background. Now I want to start kind of with the background of my story, and I. I don't want to belabor it. I'll just say after a few other careers, I got my foot in the door in Hollywood and worked my way up the ranks in post-production, started in actually in casting and then into post-production. I was an assistant editor, then became an editor, then became a union editor and then an award winning. Well, the award I won was for producing, but so I worked my way up uh, and kind of quickly in a span of about 15 years. And then I saw a window of opportunity, let's say. I was losing my job. <laughs> uh, I saw I had about four or five months uh, notice then that, that the show I was working on was going off the air. And it was either a matter of me finding another show, another job to, to hop onto or to pursue other things um, rather than working for other people, maybe I have what it takes to produce my own thing. And, and I had been writing, uh, not only am I, have I been an editor and a producer, but a, a writer. And I mean, I haven't been paid to write, but I taught myself how to write and read a bunch of books and r wrote a few screenplays and found a mentor. And I mentioned him last week, a guy named Dave McFadzian. And um, right here, let, let's, let's hear Dave's side of the story of how we met. When Michael and I first met, we were having coffee, and since we're both writers, we began talking about writing. And I began to recognize in Michael, uh, he really had a passion for storytelling. 
he really had stories he thought should be told, but more importantly, that he wanted to tell. So from that, um, I said, send me some scripts. I can get them covered. We can start talking more about what your talent is. The coverage came back very strong. Uh, and uh, we began to talk about his current projects. But um, the, real, the, the real high point was when he came in with, uh, with this story. And uh, everything he said about it, his whole demeanor, was that he was 100% uh, involved in this story and knew how important it was. And that kind of enthusiasm uh, rubbed off on me. My very first coffee with Dave was after he had read one of my screenplays. Now, I knew Dave. I'd seen him socially, but I had never had a sit-down one-on-one with him. And uh, I had written a science fiction screenplay and had gotten it to uh, his reader. So he had a guy working for him that would read basically the first line of defense. Like everybody that wants to get a script into his hands, he can't read every script that people want him to read. So he has a, a guy that will read and give notes. And if the script is good enough, it'll get to Dave himself. And so I got past his reader. His reader actually gave me notes and I did those notes and that guy gave it to Dave and Dave read it. And that started our, what I refer to as our mentor mentee relationship. Like he would say, Oh, you know, we're friends, but really he's the seasoned expert in town. And I'm, you know, relative newcomer compared to him. I've only been doing it 15 years. He's been doing it 30 to 40 years and has had great success. So he liked that the sci-fi script that I'd given to him. And it wasn't, I wasn't going to him to say, Hey, will you produce this? Cause I knew that's not a genre. I just wanted an expert opinion and wh whether I should pursue writing or just s stick to editing and, and producing or whatever. And so Dave is a writer first and then a producer. I mean, he started as a writer and, and writing is, I think the most important discipline in Hollywood, uh, you are in command of the story. If you are a good writer, you have an advantage over anybody else. Unless you have a whole ton of ton of money. And that's why a lot of bad movies get made. People with money throw their money at a project that they think is good and it they don't hire a good writer. It just gets made in, you know, tanks. Or you put a lot of special effects in it and people just go to see it anyway. Oh, anyway, I digress. So, um, uh, that was like four or five years ago. Then I saw my job coming to an end. This was three years ago. This was uh, about this time in 2017. I had written something else. I decided to start writing a uh, TV pilot. I'd never written a TV script and I'd never written comedy. And this, this idea I had was comedic, absolutely. And so I just wrote it. I wrote the pilot and it was actually the easiest thing I'd ever written. I, it just, because it's semi-autobiographical, just some events in my own life that are just comedic that like, I can't believe this really happened. And I put it into a story and it just flowed. And so I got that into his hands around August of 2017 at the end. And I just went back to my diary to make sure I had the dates right. So it was late August when he and I sat down for coffee and he had read this script and mind you my job was coming to an end in September and so I'm like, I'm like maybe this script is the thing that I'm going to move on to maybe I'm going to find an investor for it but first I want to hear what Dave has to say about it I, you know, I had written it's comedy and I didn't even think of Dave as I was writing it because Dave did comedy he created Roseanne and Home Improvement or he was a writer on Roseanne one of the creators and created Home Improvement with a couple writing partners so that's his wheelhouse. So I gave it to him. We had coffee and he, he loved it. And for him to say that, uh, it put basically wind in my sails that I was on the right track, that I should pursue this. He said the right things to, to inspire me to go out on my own rather than look for another editing job to, to go out on my own. So about a month later, I was sitting in an office building in Glendale. It was September 25th of 2017. And I say that date 
for a reason. We'll get back to that, um, but it was that specific date. September 25th, I'm sitting in an office building across from a potential investor. And this is not a guy who's necessarily a Hollywood investor, but he, he has access or had access at the time to money and was looking for projects to potentially invest in. So I pitched a bunch of things. I pitched this TV pilot to him. I pitched the other script, the science sci-fi script to him. I even pitched, well, I pitched a bunch of things to him and, and, you know, nothing was sticking. He was saying, Oh, that's interesting. And then he would move on and, and change the subject. And you always, you have to have, well, if you're ever going to a pitch meeting, don't put all your eggs in one basket, have at, at least three ideas. And I had at least three ideas and pitched them all and none of them stuck. But he said the words that really changed my course. He he said, there must be an Armenian Geronimo. Well, he said, uh, have you ever heard of the Armenian genocide? We're sitting in a, a sky rise in Glendale, California, which uh, if you don't know, it's I think the highest concentration of Armenians outside of the country of Armenia. Is that right, Armin? Um, no, I'm not sure exactly. I think maybe there might be, I think it may be because I'm trying to think if maybe Moscow has, uh, in Russia has a, a larger concentration of Armenians, but if I'm not mistaken, I think that is correct. Uh, well, at least in the United States, Glendale is certainly the, the largest concentration of Armenians. This guy, though, was not Armenian, but he grew up with a bunch of Armenian friends. And he says to me, you know, I'm, I, I know the Armenian genocide is this awful thing, but there must be a hero like an Armenian Geronimo. And that, you know, toward the end of the meeting, I, you know, I, I knew he wasn't investing in my stuff, but he, he had pointed me in this other direction. So as I left that meeting, I, I, I was like, uh, maybe I should look into it. I got to my car, opened up my phone, and I saw there was a headline. The very first thing that my eyes fell upon was the words Armenian Genocide Movie. And it was a headline about a documentary that was about to come out. And, and it was actually a, one produced by uh, Dean Cain and Montel Williams called Ar Architects of Denial, I believe is the name of it. It was just about to come out. And, you know... I don't really believe in coincidences, so I took that as a sign. Mm, maybe I should look into that. And I, in the previous episode, I talked about my friend at work, Marina. Um, we showed you a bite of her. And that, that moment, literally after I saw that headline, I texted Marina. She was sitting in an edit bay, and she gets a text from me saying, what do you know about the Armenian genocide? So well, Marina had taken me to Wikipedia. Now, I want to I want to make a note about Wikipedia because Marina watched the last episode and she was like, oh, Wikipedia, we should not, if we want to be taken seriously, let's not talk about Wikipedia. And I'm like, oh, fair enough, but you took me there. Uh, and it is a, a prime, a first, if you don't have time to run to a library and look some stuff up, just go on Wikipedia. And, you know, to be, to be fair, they get some things right, right? Not everything they say is correct. You know, it's self-editing or crowd editing. Uh, and so, but that's when I first learned about these guys. Uh, these are the the ARF, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. If you, you know, if I hear about Armenian Geronimo, there must be an Armenian Geronimo. And then I see this picture. I'm like, oh, look at all these guys with rifles and bandolero bullet belts. Uh, maybe there's a Geronimo in this picture. So then I come across the name of a, you know, the architect of the genocide that this Talat Pasha guy was assassinated. And I'm like, what? And assassinated by who? Sogomon Talirian? I'm like, wait a minute. So the guy who orchestrated this whole genocide was assassinated by an Armenian? Oh, and he went on trial? Oh, and he was acquitted? Wait, why don't I know about this? So I find a bookstore in Glendale, an Armenian bookstore. And I go in, and that's where I found this book. So this, as I is like the third time I've brought it up, but this was my introduction. This is like, who is this guy? Uh, he went on trial. Now there's a name on here. Uh, can you see that? Yeah, 
Vartkis, how do you spell his last name or how do you pronounce his last name, Armin? In Armenian, you pronounce it Yeriyayan. So Vartkis Yeriyayan? Mm -hmm. It's the, the sound. Oh, Yeriyayan? Yeriyayan? Yikes. You I got to work on it. I got to work on it. All right. Well, so I find this book and I start reading it and it is riveting. It's an actual transcript from the trial. But at the beginning, you know, it doesn't launch right into the transcript. This guy, Vartkis, gives an overview of the genocide, the importance to the Armenian people, how it's they've been facing a campaign of denialism for 100 years you know, I just, my eyes open up and, and there's a personal story that Varkas, this guy actually knew Sogomon Tolerian personally, that when he, when Varkas was a young man in his twenties, early twenties, that he lived in, he was going to law school in Berkeley and in the Bay area. And it turns out Sogomon had moved to the Bay Area, I, San Francisco proper, I believe, in like 1956. And so this story that Vartkus recounts here is him and his father. So Vartkus's father was visiting from, I think he was living in Egypt at the time, and his father came to visit, and, and Vartkus takes him to this restaurant, uh, a very popular Armenian restaurant. And... Uh, is it Mardikian? George Mardikian? George Mardikian. Yeah. So uh, he, uh, Vartkis takes his father to this restaurant and then they, they go and visit like the offices of the restaurant and, and he introduces him to George and maybe his father knew George. I don't know. But then he introduces him to this other guy who's doing the books in another office. And it's all in, you know, it's recounted in the beginning of this book that, that Vartkis takes his, takes his father into this bookkeeper and they're of the same generation. They, they'd both, you know, been around during the genocide and then they talk for, for a little while. And then Varkas takes his father out into the elevator and Varkas, while they're in the elevator, tells his father, oh, by the way, you realize that was Sogomon Tolerian, right? And his father stops the elevator. He's like, what? Because Sogomon was using an alias. He used a different name. And, and, and his father says, what? Take me back. And so... Varkas takes his father back into the bookkeeper's office. So Mardikian had been employing uh, Sogomon, giving, giving him a job, you know, laying low. And Varkas and his, Varkas' father and Sogomon had a long one-hour conversation. I think he recounts how his father wanted to kiss his finger or whatever, because Sogomon's revered by those who, who know what really happened and paid attention. Now, all of this is fascinating to me now. And I look up this guy, Vartkis, and find out that his offices were in Glendale, California. It turns out the guy who wrote this, you know, translated this transcript and who had met personally Sogomon Tolerian had an office in Glendale. And it turns out it was in the same building where I had met with that investor, that potential investor, like a month prior to this. Fast forward when I met Armin, uh, <laughs> there's another connection. So Armin, tell me, you're connected to this guy as well. Tell me about your experiences with Var Vartkus. Um, you know, last time when we were talking, uh, I opened up by saying how there are these singular individuals that you encounter in history. And so we talked about Gabriel Princip, and that segued into Solomon Tillerian. And um, in a way, Vatkes Yerian was also one of those singular people who you do come across. And I was thinking about it the other day when I realized that I spent about a, a, a quarter of my life at the time working at this law office that he had in Los Angeles. So I joined the the law office back in September of 2010, just a few months after I'd finished my undergrad at UCLA in history. And um, I understood that he was looking for a, a researcher to fill in his uh, office. And, you know, the 
the job description intrigued me and wait so you worked for this guy were... you worked in his, his office. office yeah this was your boss he was my boss for seven years yeah boss and ultimately a you know a mentor and a close friend so what did you what did you do in the office so I originally was brought in to help organize the archives, archival material that they had at the office, which they had collected over the past decade and a half in helping to file Armenian genocide restitution cases. And as wait, 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 time rewind, went, rewind, uh, rewind, rewind. So you were a, a staff historian, basically. You had to take care of the archives. Um, yeah, I mean, the staff historian really encapsulates or captures what I would do for the, the next seven years at the, the law firm. So a lot of research at libraries, institutions, in different countries. And All right. So you were paid to do research into the Armenian genocide because Vardkas's law office, one of the things they focused on was restitution for those who had been in, uh, exterminated in the genocide is that correct um yeah i mean uh you know in the i guess in the, the legally uh, attempting to obtain legal rest uh obtaining restitution for victims of the armenian genocide or at the very least the the heirs because by the time those lawsuits were being filed in the late 1990s and early 2000s, there weren't too many uh, survivors of genocide left alive. So these were these were lawsuits filed against the government of Turkey or the insurance companies or how? What was that? Yeah, initially they began against uh, insurance companies that were doing business in the Ottoman Empire in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and then the later lawsuits then focused on other. Uh, defendants and one of uh, one of the cases that was filed in 2010, for example, was filed against uh, the Republic of Turkey, or at least it's it's, it's so the Republic of Turkey and the agricultural land, lands that had been confiscated during the genocide. Obviously, there were innumerable atrocities and horrific things that took place, but one of them was that when these our entire Armenian families were eliminated with without a trace that all of their property became property of the Ottoman Empire or their their insurance claims their insurance claims were collected by the government by by the Ottomans actually the insurance policies from what I understand the companies never paid the Ottoman state directly for the the deaths of their Got it. Policy. So the but there there the attempts were made at least. But, but there was a one yeah very famous attempt by Talat to demand the life insurance policies of Armenians who had uh, had a, you know a policy of New York life. Got it. All right. He, he was denied that. Anyways, let me just. So, for me, meeting you. And having already read this book and realizing that this guy's offices were in the building that I had already been in. And then I meet you and you worked for this guy. And for me, it's like, man, I need to, I need to, I need to meet this guy. So when did Vartkus pass away? I think it was uh, just almost uh, three years ago. So September of 2017. I just looked it up. It was September 30th, 29th or 30th, at least Wikipedia, if I'm going to believe that, was September 30th, 2017. So it was five days after I had been in that same building. This guy passed away. It's like two ships passing in the night. Like I was never going to get to meet him. I was so close to meeting him. I couldn't believe his office was a couple floors above where I was at that moment. So for me, it's like, wow. And then I meet you and the way you've explained your relationship to me, that your relationship with Varkas was, was 
as you said, not just an employee, not just a staff historian, but as a, like he was your mentor. Eventually we'll get into more of him and your, and how he's kind of been important even for me, even though I never met him, the fact that I read this book to me, it was like, this is a movie. I even thought of that scene that he talked about his, his father meeting Sogomon. I'm like that, that'd be a scene in a movie. I could totally see that. Um, and then I meet you because Vartkus passed away. I meet you at like the next best thing, you know, uh, and you send me on basically you say, well, read this book, read this book, read this book. And you, any questions I have, I can text you or call you and say, it, you know, instantly I've got my historian uh, who's who's already connected to the story. I mean, isn't it, does it feel strange being so connected to the story that you work for a guy who knew Sogomon, who's the hero of the Armenian people? Are you, is this as surreal for you as it is for me? Um, I'm not sure if maybe surreal uh, really captures it, but I would say it is uh, sobering at times to just think about the the degrees of connection and how, again, you can um, work years alongside somebody who lived such an extraordinary life and um, develop acquaintances with people who are household names when or are very well known in uh, the world of politics and law and um, other other fields, professional fields. Yeah, I want to talk about an important character. Before I met you, I met another guy. I don't know if we'll get to that this week. Maybe next week. I met. I met the. I won't. I haven't talked to him and gotten permission from him to mention him by name in this podcast, but I will reach out to him eventually. But uh, the, before I met you, I met this other guy who's connected to Operation Nemesis. Did you have that book by any chance? Uh, I have it lying around somewhere here, yeah. Because uh, that was the book I read after this. So I, I lent it out to someone. There's a book called Operation Nemesis that is written by uh, Eric Bogosian, who's uh, an Armenian actor, a screenwriter, um, very talented. In fact, I remember him when I looked him up, I remember seeing him in episodes of like Law and Order and then random films. He was in a movie I just watched recently, uh, Uncut Gems. Have you heard of that movie? Yeah, I've heard of it. I actually have not seen it, but if he's right. in it, I probably would watch it. So the, here's a little, uh, this this podcast is called Hollywood and History. Let's talk a little bit about ho uh, Hollywood. So Uncut Gems. Now, Adam Sandler is famous for mindless bro comedy stuff, but Uncut Gems is really a tour de force for him because, you know, Adam Sandler's in the, he, he plays a, 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 a jeweler in New York city. And it, it, he just shows his talent. He's a talented guy, but uh, Eric Bogosian has a pretty good role in that film. I went, I, I didn't realize Eric was in that movie when I uh, watched it, but I, I, I knew right away. I'm like, Oh, and, and he's, it's a good role anyway. So Eric Bogosian being Armenian, uh, when I started reading his book uh, called operation nemesis, it reminded me of my own journey coming to this story, even though he had a little more history. He, you know, his grandfather told him, well, if you read the book, you'll understand. But he also read the transcript and it was the exact same mental process. I'm like, oh, my gosh, maybe it's a courtroom drama where we go and and you, you tell the story and you start in the courtroom and then you flash back to events. And, you know, it just was it was lining up the exact same kind of epiphanies I was having. But he my journey went a different direction. He, he, he stepped back and was telling this whole big story of the genocide and did a pretty good job putting it in uh, layman's terms, I guess, or it's more of a, a you know, popular history. Uh, he did a fairly good job. And, you know, you've, you've fact checked it and found some errors. Yes. And I've read through it and found some things, but it's inevitable. If, if this, court transcript is all you have to go on 
about Sogum and Tolerian. And if you think everything that's stated in the trial is true, if you think it's true, then you're inevitably going to be incorrect. And so Bogosian has a few errors in his book, but I still recommend it. I, I, if I had a copy here, I'd show the book. Here, I'll put a picture up. Uh, I recommend, definitely recommend reading this if you're interested in a good, good, easy read overview of the Armenian Genocide and Operation Nemesis. So this character that will go unnamed right now uh, was related to one of the three main guys in Operation Nemesis. Operation Nemesis was a, a spy ring, an espionage, you know, let's let's assassin these bad guys that got away, let's, let's, let's assassinate them and um, so I got connected with one of the relatives of the, these masterminds. And so that was the, like, speaking of being connected real quick, it's like, wow, it didn't take me long. To, I was in the right place at the right time. Turns out this bookstore was the right place to go. Um, can you talk a little bit as we wrap this up about what's some of, some of the lies or some of the falsehoods or some of the omissions from the trial. You don't, you don't have to go into too much detail, but just do a little overview of some of the things that people will learn are not true. I mean, here we are. We're going we're gonna to share the truth. This channel is called Tales of Truth. We've done the research, uh, more research than anyone else has done into these facts, uh, arguably. Um, so enlighten us. What, what is wrong in this transcript. My next door neighbor is Armenian. We talk constantly. My, uh, my, uh, my coffee shop is Armenian. And uh, all the Armenians come in there and I hear them talking and understand nothing. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the young lady that serves me coffee is beginning to teach me Armenian words. She's just begun. so. Uh, so that's the extent of my understanding of the Armenian culture. Other than to say, I can see, first of all, my, my, my interaction with um, uh, anybody uh, of Armenian heritage has um, always been fun and exciting and found them to be very, very welcoming.